Welcome everyone. This is Sheila from NC Lab and today we're going to learn a little bit about the Python turtle and how you can turn it into a wonderful art lesson that introduces students to coding and other aspects of what we call STEAM, which of course stands for Science, Technology, Engineering. We throw the A in there in capitals because we're promoting art today and M for Mathematics. As I said, I'm Sheila Bunch. I'm the Director of Education for NC Lab. And we're very grateful this webinar series is made possible by a Nevada State Library Archives and Public Records Continuing Education Grant funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services through the Library Services and Technology Act. For those of you who aren't familiar with NC Lab, we provide a self-contained desktop platform where you can learn and use computer programming, modeling, and many other STEM skills. The way you learn is through self-paced, self-graded courses. This is nice for institutions where they don't have a computer expert on staff. You can simply set up your clients or students, whatever the case may be, with an account and they can learn themselves. Once you've learned a few skills, then you want to apply them, and we do have apps in the Creative Suite to apply the skills that you learn in the course. We'll be looking at the Python Turtle app today. And then thirdly, we are building a number of hands-on activities. So what you learn on the computer, you can bring those skills to real-life applications, and vice versa. You can do real-life activities to help reinforce what you are learning on the computer. So today, I'm going to introduce turtle drawing programs. There's a little history behind them. And very briefly address brain learning, a little bit about multiple modalities of learning and about sensory motor skills. You're going to learn how to use some pre-made scripts that come with the app to create endless variations and you can also use the scripts within the Python 1 course. You're also going to learn a little bit about exporting files for artwork, 3D printing and 2D cutting. We're going to emphasize 3D printing today and we'll walk through creating a pendant and the 3D modeling process. So, turtle drawing programs. Well, this goes back to the mid-60s. Uh, these, these were people working in Boston. Some of them were associated with MIT, and there were other companies there at the time and other, inst other educational institutions involved. Uh, Seymour Papert is probably the most famous of that group. Really was a key player in computer programming education throughout his life. And so these are some of the members of the team. Wally Furzig, Seymour Papert, Cynthia Solomon, and that's a picture of her on the right. Marvin Minsky, and there were others. They developed what they called Logo, which is Greek for thought, as an educational programming language. There were some previous attempts to develop educational languages for, for kids. Uh, they felt that uh, they were not appropriate for younger people, so they came up with their own. And one of Cynthia's key roles was trying out the program in the field with kids. She's also very much a hands-on developer herself. She was in computer programming before they came together to develop Logo. And she's now 80 years old. She's still around and still very passionate about uh, computer programming education. So one of the resources I encountered when I was checking into the background on this was a, a wiki space that she developed. Lots of good first-person information. She's sharing some of her archives. I also noticed that Wikispace is in the process of shutting down. It's been around for a while. It has been used by teachers for many years. Uh, many classrooms set up their own wiki spaces, but they decided as a company that it was going to be too, too costly to overhaul the site, and it was really in need of an overhaul, so they're simply shutting it down. So if you're interested in learning more about Logo, there's the 
URL at the base of the screen and when you get the slideshow of course it'll be a live URL and uh, it's kind of fun to browse it's, and it's very kid friendly there's nothing there that you have to worry about for kids. This is a, the first turtle built by Marvin Minsky that was used at MIT. It's a floor turtle. If it looks like a vacuum cleaner, well, yeah, it does kind of look like a vacuum cleaner. It actually is built from parts that he found in a Department of Defense junkyard. And it's based on a design that came out of Great Britain. It's, it's actually a type of robot. And why is it a turtle? Well, it sort of looks like a turtle. It has a shell. It has four wheels. So you can think of those as the feet sticking out. And hence the nickname. So this is a physical object. This is a, a wired turtle. It had a tether attached to the computing device and eventually it came up with a wireless one. So you weren't limited to the length of a cord. And uh, you can see the inheritance in Lego Mindstorms type devices that communicate with the computer and various iterations of turtle used to teach programming, including ours. So the turtle could be a physical object. It could be just a, simply a blinking cursor, a triangle. We use a little turtle icon and the, its main function is to draw lines. This graphic output provides powerful instant feedback to the written code. So you can be writing a script. How do you know it works? Well, you see it work as a visualization. I'm just gonna show you this. So there's, there's the floor turtle. And you can see it has a, a white pen coming out of it, and that's actually doing the drawing. So it's doing its turns and its forward motion, inscribing arcs. So think of this when, when you're looking at our turtle drawing on the graph, Here's an example of a turtle drawing on a floor, and this is Marvin Minsky's turtle. One of the key features of turtle drawing programs was that they created a, an environment, and sometimes these are referred to as worlds, and this allows for play. You're not just learning from a linear set of instructions. You can just invent what's gonna happen with that turtle that time they called it constructionist learning. Now it tends to be referred to as constructivist. Uh, they really believe that children could experiment and try different patterns, goals, attributes, and levels of complexity. In effect, teach themselves by playing. I recommend getting some books out for your students. Uh, they've all published extensively and the, the books are well worth reading. So there's a library connection for you. Okay, so I'm going to touch briefly on what I, I really sort of have developed a dislike for right side of the brain. I just call it the creative side because there really isn't a side. We, it, it's been a habit to describe people, creative people as right brained and logical people as left brained. The MRI data does not uh, back that up. There is some specialization in each hemisphere. But what has been determined is that most functions can be done by either hemisphere. But this is really important from a survival standpoint. When your brain gets injured, it, it has to be able to heal itself in, as quickly as possible in order to function. So uh, it'll learn what it needs to learn unless there's incredibly severe damage. So we know that, we know that this is not true anymore, but you look at any individual and for whatever reason, biology, environment, education, everybody has their own mix of logical, linear, lateral, even random approaches to problem solving and creativity. So we do know everybody learns differently and that's okay. We want to bring all these different brains to the table. This is how we generate, um, uh, new approaches to problem solving by putting our heads together and it, we're, we're very grateful that we're all different. The other factor is that this is a plastic mixture. It's been shown time and time again that 
that uh, people can learn after a stroke, that uh, people who have disabilities that they are born with can be taught in areas that previously were considered impossible. And so this is something to keep in mind too. Even though someone might come to you and appear to be very narrow in their approach, that can be changed. So as educators, it behooves us to recognize this, to nurture people as they come in with their own particular mix, to help open the doors for them to areas they may have never thought they could master, to use their talents and really to celebrate that mixture in all of us. So all of the above. The other thing I want to touch on briefly is Piaget's research on how people learn. And, and his stuff is really ancient at this point. It's 100 years old, but it still holds up pretty well. And the starting point in learning for babies is sensory motor. They're just using their senses and their motor skills to interact with the environment. It starts with putting everything in their mouth, and it goes from there. But one of the concerns right now is that we're so wired in that we're taking time away from developing what you might call natural sensory motor skills. Are we developing sensory motor skills? Of course we are. They're developing a little differently in the past. And I know as a teacher, I saw this in school, uh, that kids were losing some of what used to be quite well developed by the time they came to me in third and fourth grade. For, for example, their handwriting looked a little bit more like uh, a kindergartner's than a third or fourth grader. So it's partly because education is so overwhelmed with everything we need to teach that it wasn't emphasized. But also it, it comes from the whole environment. If they're not doing things with their hands, especially fine motor skills, then they lag in that area of development. So. This is something we're called upon to keep a balance, I would, in my opinion, that we want to develop those skills in both what you might call the real world and the simulated world. We need both. So how do we do that? Well, we can do activities that use our physical senses. We can use body movement. You can act things out. We can certainly draw with a pencil and paper and craft tangible objects. All right, so this is a group of uh, kids I worked with last year, and they did the exercise that I'm going to show you, although they didn't get to print anything out. They created arts and crafts at a table, and you can see this is these are boxes that I put together. There's maybe $12 worth of stuff from Walmart in those boxes. As they're not expensive. Pencils and pens and crayons and markers and sticky notes and compasses, rulers, and different kinds of paper to do some basic crafting at the table. And scissors, of course. You can have that going on. At the same time, you're learning art mathematically through Python on the computer. And uh, this harks back also to my memories in high school. I was blown away by what math looked like when you plotted it on a graph. It, to me, was astonishingly beautiful and I just loved it. What I hope is that kids will also get that aha moment when they see how a function plots. When I say kids, this can apply to adults as well of course. And then the third the third part of this is we're going to print some 3D artifacts that can be incorporated. It, they act, it, this acts as a bit of a bridge between the two. So this is what the Python app looks like. And you get to it by going to Creative Suite and then click on Programming and you'll see an app called Python Turtle. And this allows you to draw patterns and also simulate autonomous robots. Remember that floor turtle, it was a type of robot. So it's not just a drawing tool, it's also practicing some robotics. Um, I do have a link here at the bottom to a video that Una Gulper and I put together about a year ago. She used to work for the Carson City Library. And so you'll have that link. And it's, it's a nice little tour of how to use this app. I am going to leave the screen for a moment because I'm going to walk you through it live. 
So here's the desktop. I'm going to close that too. I don't want to show that. All right, so there's Creative Suite and Programming and Python Turtle. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger and I'm also going to enlarge the font a little bit. In fact, I'm going to go a bit more. We can scroll it because I want to point out some features to you. Okay, so one feature is anytime you see uh, the code in sort of a brownish color with a hashtag in front of it, these are known as comment lines and you can write anything in there and the program will ignore it. Okay, so these are typically used to help describe what's going on in the program. For instance, on line three here, it says edge length, and then on line four, it says E equals 30. You have a pretty good idea that if line three says edge length, that line four, that's exactly what's going on. It's setting an edge length to 30 units. Then the next line says line color, and in this case, the color is set to gold. And next, we're creating a turtle. This is an instance of a class of turtles, and her name happens to be Tina. Now, this is kind of, sometimes kids have fun with this. They could call it anything, and they could call it George, but then all my script would have to be George. You can name any instance of a class anything you want. And then we're going on and we're specifying some qualities of the line. So the line width is three, the line height is three, and that's important for 3D printing. And then the line color is set by this value up here, or this name up here. And then this program is set to make random combinations of loops. So it's importing random, which is a library, and then it's setting the number of polygons as a random integer between the values of four and 10. And then it's sending the number of sides between three and eight. So now we get into what we call a for loop. In Python, this is, the, this is what's used to repeat a set of actions a number of times. And in this case, we're using what's called an index. And we're setting it to this value of n, which is randomly selected here. And then we're drawing a polygon with m edges. And again, that's set randomly here. And uh, this equation or this relationship of the turn here is related to the number of degrees in a circle divided by the number of sides. So this is always going to give us something that's perfectly symmetrical. Well, we can mess with that too. So let's just run this and see what it looks like. All right, and there we have the polygon itself is a hexagon. So the random value that was chosen was six, and then it's repeated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. So the n value turned out as eight. So if I run this again, Uh, this time I got a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sided polygon and it ran one, two, three, four, five, six times. So every time I run this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to roll the dice on the number of sides and the number of times that polygon is repeated. And it looks like sometimes it has its favorites. Okay, there's another one. All right, now we can throw in a little extra fun here too. We can choose a random color. So we can go Tina, ran color, just like that. And now let's run it and see what happens. So you can see that this time it changed colors randomly every time I drew a new polygon. That's because I put it in this part of the loop. Now let's say, I, I'm gonna just comment that out because I don't wanna disturb the piece here. But this time I'm gonna put it in my inner loop. Tina ran color. Okay. All right, so this time it changed colors every time I 
draw another line on the polygon. So it gets quite colorful. There's other things you can do. You can set, and we've talked about RGB values before, you can set RGB values. But then we can do something with this drawing. And this is a three-dimensional drawing. You can see it's fairly thin. We can export it. So let's say, oh, I really love this. This is pretty. Okay, I am going to just reset my view. No, I am going to view it actually from the top. Okay, and then I'm going to clean it up a little bit. I'm going to get rid of the axes and the grid. All right, and maybe I'll zoom in. Nope, I'm going to zoom out a bit. All right, I like that. I'm going to use that as part of a picture. So then I can export it and save it as a PNG file. There's my folder. I can name it Fun Polygon. And I have it downloaded now in a folder on my computer. And now I can use that image any which way I want. Okay, I can also, and I'm going to comment out the random color here. Okay, so that's, that's playing around with it for just pictures. I'm going to keep the default color here gold. So I'm going to run it again. <laughs> okay, this time I have a design like this. And let's say I want to use this to make my pendant. I'm going to put a little hanger. I'm going to maybe hang my rope at this end. This is fine for my design. So this time I'm going to export it as uh, an STL file. Now I can save it in my cloud drive or, for example, I could save it to a thumb drive that I can take over to my printer and I can just save it there. And now I have a, a file that can be read by a slicer. If you find a design you like, you know, I really like this idea of a six-sided polygon repeated four times. You can comment out these lines because now you found something you like. And you can write in, so we had a M equals four there. And N, we're repeating it. Nope, M equals six. I'm sorry, that's the six sided polygon. And, oh, not 64. And N equals four. So now I'm no longer random. I'm going to run that again. It should come up with the same thing. Yes, it did. All right, I can play with this a little bit because I'm going to say, you know what, I think I would like to make my depth a little thicker. I'm going to beef this up a bit. So I'm going to give it a height of five and I'm going to make these lines just slightly wider as well. And you can use decimal values. So I'm going to make them just a little wider and run it again. Because now I'm tuning it up for export. Okay, I like that. That looks like it's a little sturdier. That'll hold up nicely. So now I'm going to export it as an STL file. And that's the one I'm going to print. So there we go. It's ready to go. So I'm going to go back to the slideshow. There's a lot to this. And you can play with all these values. It, it really, if you mess it up, there's no harm. You can just open it up again and the program will be there. But the other thing is you can pull out images from the course itself. It has that same menu in the viewer. You can export any image you like as an STL file. So these are some examples that I printed out. This is from level uh, 6.3. In other words, that's section 6 and level 3 within that section. That's from 6.6. .6. This one happens to be, it shows up a couple times in the course, happens to be from 13.3 and that's from 13.7. And that one even has a little hole in it ready to run a thread through for, for a pendant. Uh, let the kids mess with this, or adults, because aren't we all kids at heart? Just mess with the script. Try numbers. There's no harm that can come out of it. You can play with the line width, the height and extrude values, the number of repetitions in the for loops, which is what we did. You can change the go distance. That was that E, the line length. You can mess with the turn angles. You can introduce RGB colors. This is how to write that code. You write it as a list. That's your red, green, blue values. Or insert Tina Rand color to generate some random colors and have a little fun.
this is one school where I did this exercise and you can see this is some of the stuff the kids came up with from playing with the values. There's one and that's three hexagons. They really like the symbol. Apparently it's related to some game, but they were quite excited when it came up. This is one that has a lot of repetitions and a little messing with the turn angles. It came up with a really pretty pattern. This one, as you can see, lost its symmetry, but it ended up in sort of a bow tie object, which, you know, that can be quite fun too. When they're playing with it, just a little word to the wise, you may need to clean up the file a little bit for 3D printing. Um, the printer's not gonna like 100 iterations of something when really you should only have five. Um, so that's just a little cautionary note. Okay, so what can we make? Well, we can export PNG files and that can be used for all kinds of two-dimensional art. You can export STL files for 3D printing and SVG files. These are vector graphic files for laser cutting. This is what we've used, but I have noticed that with cutting some programs like SVGs and others prefer uh, PNG graphic files. So again, I showed you where you can find that on the viewer menu. This is how you export them. And some tips on PNG files. You can print them out in either 2D or 3D. You might find a really cool angle rotating objects and, and that's what you want to take a picture of. They are WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. So whatever you have in the viewer, that's what's going to show up on your PNG file. You can uncheck the axes and grid so that you get a clean image or maybe you want the, the, the field in there. It, that's just a, a matter of preference. If you are really looking for a clean 2D image, something that's going to be used with a stencil cutter, you can select 2D from the view window and get no odd looking edges. It'll be a perfect 2D image. If you're exporting an image for a stencil cutter, just keep it as one color rather than say the RAN color. So here's an example of using some PNG files. I just made four different objects and exported them. And um, I just built this in Word. I just imported the images into a Word document and uh, played with them, scattered them about, resized them. Uh, what's really fun though is if you start getting into uh, a graphic arts editor and that can be anything from paint which comes on a Windows machine, could be something advanced like Adobe Illustrator or, or CorelDRAW or if some of you might be familiar with GIMP and basically you can use PNG images in any program that will import pictures. Okay, this picture over here is a Brothers Scan and Cut, and I know some of you have cry cuts as well. There's a number of machines on the market that will cut out stencils. Some of them will cut vinyl or, or uh, cardstock. Just be aware that you can go through blades like crazy doing this, and they can also plot. This gal was plotting an image she created with Tina in the program, and it's, this is the result next to her. Yes, it does look like a spirograph. That's sort of the same idea. That's what spirographs do. We have a lovely laser cutter at our disposal here in the makerspace. And uh, this was um, plotting out some images created both by the Python 1 program, the turtle, and in the 3D modeling program. And these are 2D images. The third dimension comes from the thickness of the material. So you are working with 2D images. So I have a couple of links here. One link is uh, some designs that you can download. This is from our blog page. So you can see there's a bunch of designs. And the other link is a video. Well, it explains our experience with with laser cutting, but it also has a video showing how laser cutter works. And it's sort of hypnotic. And, you know, it reminds me of those videos where you're just watching somebody do something and it's relaxing to watch. <laughs> it's fun to watch the laser cutter. And when you're watching it live, it also smells good because it's got this sort of burnt wood smell. It's kind of fun. We're going to go a little more detail into exporting files for 3D printing because this is a project you can do at your library that's fairly painless as 3D printed projects go.
we're going to make a 3D printed pendant or medallion, it, you know, either way. If you hang it on a string, it's, it's a pendant, right? And this is something you can make as a little gift. The advantage of making a pendant is that you can size them fairly small. They're not very thick, they're fairly flat, so they print quote unquote quickly. And they're less likely to have errors than a, a three dimensional object that's complex. And they use less material. So uh, this is a great starter project. Some tips when you export files, make sure your lines in your drawing are connected. Um, Check the line width, height, and extrude thickness. So height and extrude do the same thing. They, they give it that third dimension. And also the size before you save. Now the program only operates in units. You set the units at the printing end, but even with that being said, you want to keep your objects somewhat in the same size range because you're going to print several at once. So, for example, you, if you're doing this project with a group of people, you might say, hey, try and keep your object about 50 units on your graph in dimension. That way, when you go to print them, they're going to be similar. As they learn programming, this is a little more advanced. You can add features like a little hanger, or you can put them on a base. And uh, the course will teach you how to do the base, the hanger. You can figure that out once you learn how to draw curves and such. The nice thing about these both being Python based is you can combine the turtle designs that you draw with the Python turtle with objects from the 3D modeling course, which has a Python wrapper. So they talk to each other quite nicely. All right, so you're going to export your STL file to a local drive and then send that file to what's known as slicer software. So think of a loaf of bread standing on end. The way the printer works is it prints in layers. So each layer has um, its own attributes and the software will create that for the printer. You can plug it in either directly through a USB drive or you can even email a service and they can open up the file and set it up from their end. So this is nice. Even if your library didn't have a, a printer, you could send these files off to be printed. Now, as I mentioned before, several files can be printed at the same time as long as they fit and use the same materials. And there are different types of filament you can use on a 3D printer. And uh, you will want to indicate the units, whether they're in millimeters or centimeters, and give the printing service an approximate idea of how big these are supposed to be. Because we all make mistakes when we design. And yeah, you don't want something that's seven millimeters when really wanted to be more like seven centimeters. So here's a screenshot of an Ultimaker. This is one of the 3D printers we have at the lab here. And you can see that each of these files are laid out on the bed. So these are all different pendant designs. You can usually fit a whole bunch, but you do want to give them a little space because they print a little perimeter around them. And you can adjust the scale. The slicer software will also test for flaws that can be corrected. Like I said, these pendants don't usually have too many flaws in them. Zooming out, this is a full screenshot. This particular slicer software is called Cura. And so up here it's selecting the printer. It's telling which extruders to use. This particular printer has two. So it can print two different materials at the same time. You're specifying the material. In this case, we're using PLA, and I'll tell you more about that later. And also, which core to use. This is a 0.4 millimeter core. Uh, the layer height. So this is not the same as the height of the objects. This is how many layers you're going to print. And the finer the layer height, the better resolution of the object. Same thing with the print speed. So if you go slower and with smaller layer height, you're going to get a much nicer looking object. The problem with that is it takes forever. So it's a compromise. And same thing with infill. There's a setting for infill, how closely you want to fill in each of the layers. Because when you're sending this to the printer, you're sending it lines. And then it's going to also decide how well it's going to fill in between the lines. Okay, so a little bit of math connection here. At a library, you may have, you may already have a printer and you may have had the supplies donated, 
But I think it's good, even when we know that you do this out of the goodness of your heart. Well, so you, you get paid not nearly enough, and there are also volunteers who don't get paid anything. But it's good for your students or participants to understand that there are costs to these. So I, I put in our invoices here that we paid for this at the Innovation Center, just to give you an idea of how that breaks down. So at the bottom, there's an intake fee. Well, you saw that Cura software, and there's actually quite a bit to setting up the job to begin with. So there's a fee for doing that, and it's based, it's a one-shot fee attached to this batch. Now, of course, I have several files that went into pendants. And then the software will, will calculate the amount of equipment time. It'll calculate the amount of materials. And then it'll also calculate the amount of time it's going to take to clean up these objects after they come off the printer. So this gives you an idea of how much this job costs in the real world. And I think it's good to share that because people never realize that there's a cost to everything. So here's some pictures of the Ultimaker that we used, uh, nicknamed Morty. I have no idea who that is, haha. -ha. Anyway, there's the, the bed that it's going to be printed on and the print head, and you can see this goes up and down. And then on the back, you can see these two reels of filament that are fed into the computer. And there's a readout on the front that tells you how much time you have left. Um, patience is a virtue. Don't expect to do this in the last 15 minutes of a lesson. It's likely to run when the participants are not there or they might get a a little bit of experience of it, but it takes a long time. This particular job took almost five hours. All right, there's some close-ups of these pendants being printed, and you can see there's a little skirt that's laid down around the outside that helps keep it in position as it's being extruded. And this is what it looks like when it comes off the printer, and you can see the skirt around the outside. This is a close-up. This is plastic, it's a little messy. So we're gonna to wanna to get rid of the, the skirt and maybe just clean up a few things here and there in our prints. And uh, this is me peeling off the edge. You can see most of the time you can get it off by hand. It, it's not exactly perforated, but it's a fairly loose connection to the object. You can take it off and there's the mess left over after these are cleaned up. And you might want to take an X-Acto knife to it as well. You know your students as well as anyone as to whether they can handle X-Acto knives or not. You can see the spiral broke when I um, tried to clean it up. Uh, I'm, that could be glued together. Or that might be a, a nice little lesson and next time I'm going to make it bigger and thicker. But all in all, these cleaned up fairly nicely. Okay, so this is something I haven't done yet. I ran out of time, but I'm gonna play with it a bit and I'll add some pictures to our post on our community page. You can paint these. And actually PLA is the best material for painting. So this is getting on to your, back to your fine motor skills and offline art. PLA stands for polylactic acid. It's a bioplastic made from corn. Some of the disadvantages uh, is that it's brittle and somewhat sensitive to heat. You can take advantage of a low melting point and anneal it to make it stronger. So look up annealing PLA and see what you can find on the internet. You can use a low temperature oven to do this. And, um, you know, as, as always, whenever you're dealing with heat, you need to stick around. Don't go off and uh, play video games or go for a walk in the mountains. You need to be there when you're doing it. So uh, a nice way to present this at the end would be to maybe tuck the pendant or the medallion inside a matching card with a PNG image on it. So you're getting lots of art for your exercise. Uh, just a very quick overview of the course. And Dr. Solon, of course, uh, builds the courses and he, he describes what is going on very well sometimes quite poetically so this is what happens in the first part of the course you're learning some basic fundamentals in programming and it doesn't matter whether it's Python or another language there's always something that repeats 
a function in Python. It's called a for loop, and there's a lot more to for loops than what I just said. You're working with variables and functions, then you get into conditions, Boolean expressions, and, and Booleans are really at the heart of programming, period. Uh, you're, everything you do is either true or false, and it builds from there. When you get into quantum computing, that might get a little more complicated, but for now, we're, we're really working off of Boolean expressions and everything we do, or Boolean uh, values, I should say. You can work with lists and while loops. So this is, these will all draw you something. And you get that nice representation in the other screen. And if you like it, like for instance, this crown could be exported and printed on a 3D printer. The second part of it is really getting into the turtle as a robot. And Tina does have this sensor. It, it, it can measure it, the distance between it and an object which is an imitation of, uh, for instance, Google uses LiDAR in the self-driving cars. Python's got great sensors, so you, have, you can use a color sensor to detect colors along the, the pathway. Uh, Tina can simulate all kinds of tasks and mazes in a way that's a little more advanced than Carol. And then the third part of the course is just really bridging two dimensions to three dimensions and also working with these multi-parameter programs where you can write your script and then play with the parameters outside of that script. So that's getting into closer to developing an API, which is where the users might only see the input screens to put the parameters in and they don't mess with the code underneath. And this is something you learn how to do in Python too. So after you finish the course, you get your lovely certificates. And as with the other courses, we redesign these so they look a little more professional. They, they don't have kids' drawings on them and they could be put into a portfolio. It will explain what you've learned. Once you finish Python 1, you can dive into Python 2. That's, and we'll, we'll do a webinar on that at some point. Or if you really like the building and modeling, you can go through the 3D modeling course. And I really encourage you to explore software that takes advantage of these designs. There's, it's, that's a whole other world. You can take what you've learned in, in Python 1 from the turtle and explore these other types of software. You will be getting a, a PDF that's a lesson plan. And this is an idea that for a Mother's Day card and a pendant, last year, uh, the library in Hawthorne did a wonderful Mother's Day card as part of a STEM night. So this is combining the two and gives you an idea of how much time you might take on each, each part of it. You can play with the app and come up with this, uh, an idea that you're going to print out as a 3D printer, do some sketching on designs for your card, then go to uh, exporting that file and um, exporting the image. And of course, the file is going to take forever to print. It probably won't be available until the next session. But in the meantime, you can make your card. Then when you come back, you can clean up and finish that pendant, maybe paint it, string it on a ribbon. And uh, if you have time left over, explore the course. So this is um, a three, roughly three 45-minute sessions with the idea that you're going to print those pendants between session two and session three. I also have a suggestion for a camp, which breaks down into six sessions, where the same idea, explore the app, and weave it in with exploring the course, because the more you know from learning from the course, the better you can use the app. The app will make more sense. So this is going back and forth between doing the heavy lifting in the course and playing with the app. Uh, at the end, once you've done all that, to go and explore some digital art online, there's some absolutely fabulous stuff out there. So what did we learn about today? A little bit of background on turtle drawing programs. They, they have been used for half a century at least to teach computer programming. A little bit on why we want to use art to teach programming. You're definitely accessing different parts of the brain, maybe attracting an audience that never thought they could program. Um, I have to tell you, 
this is how I got into science myself. I was an artist. I went to art school at the museum on the weekends. I decided to take biology because I wanted to learn an anatomy. As it turned out, high school biology has very little to do with anatomy, but was amazing to me because it described everything around us in terms of systems that completely blew my mind and I went into sciences instead. So again, uh, this is a way of inviting people into this world from a different perspective. And um, a little bit on how to use the pre-made scripts in the app to create all kinds of variations. Really, don't be afraid to make mistakes and you can pull them out of the course as well. We ended up by walking our way through a 3D printing project to make the pendants and uh, create a, a tangible object for our efforts. As always, I invite you to join the community. All the materials from these webinars are there, uh, including a cleaned up copy of this webinar, plus the slideshow, which you're free to use parts or all of in your instruction you will get the lesson plans and anything else I can think of that's helpful. Feel free to contact us anytime at support at nclab.com. There's a yellow button right on the desktop to do that. By phone if you have an emergency and need to get a hold of me right away. That usually goes to me. It sometimes goes to someone else. And remember that you also have a link to all kinds of instructor resources for each of the courses by clicking on instructor resources. Uh, whether you go to community or instructor resources, you will be prompted for your username and password because you have instructor privileges and you're getting access to materials that are exclusively for instructors. Thank you very much for joining me here live and please feel free to share these material with your colleagues if you have any questions at all when you go to do these activities, just to give me a, a holler, either email or through support or through the community. Thank you very much for joining us again and have a wonderful day.